everyone, welcome to another episode of Key Gripe, the show for short, sweet reviews of new release movies, plus the one thing that annoyed me the most. And today I'm going to be talking about Illumination Pictures' newest animated film, The Secret Life of Pets. Now, it's been out for about a month, so it's taken me a while to get here. I just didn't want to go when all the kids were there. So, um, Secret Life of Pets. Basic concept is, um, think of it almost like Toy Story, but with pets. Kind of like if our pets were somehow cognizant and how they exist in the world kind of independent of humans, how they interact with each other, how their whole you know, world basically happens. And it's, the story focuses on a dog named Max, who has a lovely relationship with his owner, Katie, and he, you know, he's you know, so happy with his life. But then Katie brings home another dog that she rescued named Duke, who's this big, puffy, brown dog. And the two immediately just kind of go at it. And in, you know, when they go out for, they're taken out for a walk one day, Duke essentially, you know, kind of annoyed by Max decides to, you know, kind of get rid of him. And in the, in the process, they both get basically abducted. They lose their collars and they get abducted by animal control. And then they're sprung by this psychotic rabbit voiced by Kevin Hart and taken to the underground. Now their friends, the other dogs in the apartment building in that area, decide to you know join together and go find them. And so it becomes this adventure both for Duke and Max kind of bonding and you know becoming you know friends and trying to run away from Snowball, the psychotic rabbit and his gang, as well as this other group of dogs and cats and birds that are trying to, and a guinea pig, I forgot the guinea pig, but <laughs> Basically, this other group that's trying to go and find them. Um, and they go on this wild adventure, you know, to the wonderful city of Brooklyn. And they come together and everybody's saved in the end. And they go back to their normal lives. Basic summary of the movie. I don't want to go into too much detail because, for one, it doesn't have much of a plot. It's a kid's movie. So, you know, it has the kind of, I mean, literally it has the same plot as Toy Story. But, um... <laughs> Uh, it's it, it's very much the same kind of story that you see with Toy Story, with Matt, with uh, Bolt, the Disney film, or you know Homeward Bound. Any of these ones about you know animals or toys or whatever getting lost and then finding their way back home. Um, that's really what this movie is, and it's certainly designed to appeal to children, which is expected. I'm not saying that adults can't enjoy this, but it's absolutely geared towards kids. Um, so who's in this movie? Um, like I said, Kevin Hart plays the psychotic rabbit. Louis C.K. does the voice of Max, the main character. Eric Stone Street does Duke. Um, so the two of them, and it's really, I'm, actually, I'm impressed that Eric Stone Street, I couldn't tell his voice. You know, he was actually able to kind of mask his, but maybe that's because I'm so used to Cameron from Modern Family that that's what I think Eric Stone Street sounds like. Uh, Jenny Slate does the voice of Gidget, the little kind of puffy Pomeranian. Um, Ellie Kemper, who I love, does the voice of Katie, although she's only in the movie in small doses, and I'm going to get to her in a bit, too. Um, Albert Brooks, uh, you can't have a good out animated movie without Albert Brooks. I love Albert Brooks. Um, he plays the hawk Tiberius, who kind of tricks Gidget into letting him go, but then becomes you know an integral part of their you know rescue effort. Uh, Lake Bell, she plays Chloe the cat. Dana Carvey plays Pops the dog. Hannibal Burris and Bobby Moynihan both play dogs. Uh, Hannibal Burris plays Buddy, this uh, dachshund with a penchant for getting his back rubbed by a uh, mixer. Um, <laughs> very funny. Um, so, you know, a decent cast. A lot of, you know, kind of the same, you know, the same old, same old, the people that we've seen in other movies recently, uh, you know, do voice. I think, you know, like a few of these, we've seen them in, you know, other movies this year animated. Uh, Jenny Slate obviously did Zootopia. Hannibal Burris was in... Angry Birds, um, so, I mean, you, you're seeing some of the same people kind of, you know, making the rounds in these animated movies, um, so it's, it's <laughs> kind of getting used to certain people doing animated movie voices, I guess, um, but, I mean, overall, the, you know, the cast does a good job with their characters, um, as much as, you know, the story allows them to do, um, I gotta say that the story really does, I mean, the movie takes a while to kind of get to its to the main plot of what's going on um which is actually kind of a weird like it's it's good and bad because like the beginning of the movie is you know what you would see in the trailer it's kind of like oh these are what happens when the owners leave these are what the pets do and they're you know in the time when they're alone and 
it just kind of explores that a little bit, you know, just this the world that they have when the owners are not around. It, it's the movie starts out with that way with that, and then jumps right into you know Max and Duke, um, kind of you know battling each other and then ultimately getting lost in New York City. So, but you would hope that in that like opening start opening scene that that's where they would start like really getting you with the comedy and hitting you with these you know funny concepts and the you know the really satirical elements you know the the fun part that you would expect from a movie called the secret life of pets and while they do it doesn't last it's it i mean it's almost like the concept for the secret life of pets was you know just to kind of throw in these little snippets of oh this is what your animals do when you're gone and then, obviously, after that, turn it into a fairly standard, you know, adventure story. Um, because, I mean, realistically, a movie that's just about animals and what they do probably wouldn't be as entertaining as this adventure story. But the way they went also makes it very normal or very ordinary, in a sense. Um, the animation, um, Illumination, they're the ones who did Despicable Me and Minions and those movies and while I'm not a fan of Despicable Me I didn't think it was a very good movie never saw the second one and I definitely didn't see Minions um, they actually before the movie starts they do a little much like any other animated feature they do a, s a short animation before the movie and this one was called Mower Minions and it was basically the Minions trying to earn twenty dollars for a blender by mowing the lawn at a senior at a retirement home basically um, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. But maybe that's just because I don't like minions. I don't think that they're funny. I don't think they're creative. It's basically just, okay, let's throw gags on the screen, but they're not earned gags. It's just, you know, these Twinkies in overalls doing, you know, stupid things, and somehow that makes it good. Um, so, but, so Illumination, who's done minions has done did secret life of pets which actually made me a little bit skeptical going into it that it was going to be a decent movie simply because despicable me fell flat where it could have succeeded same thing you know with um i think they did the lorax as well um i could be wrong but i think they did um so it's these movies that they've done that i've seen have always fell flat when they had so many opportunities and this looked like the movie with the most opportunity to really succeed because you've got a great concept I mean granted it's it is Toy Story with pets but it's still a concept that you can sell very easily and people will buy into very easily um, and for the most part I would say they succeeded um, I don't think that it was as funny as it could have been granted I'm also not a kid so there's probably things that were that are more geared towards kids that I'm just like, eh, that's cute, clever, all that. There were some moments, though, I will admit, were very clever. Um, there's one line in particular that had me just rolling. It's um, when Chloe the cat and Pops the dog meet each other. Pops is this basset hound, this paralyzed basset hound who's got a little wheelchair. And when he sees, you know, Chloe kind of like um, challenges him a little bit you know, challenges his authority, and he kind of likes that, and when he sees she's a cat, he, you know, obviously is still infatuated by her no matter what, and as they're walking away, and, you know, he says, you know, he, he makes some comment, and she's like, you know, I'm a cat, right? And he's like, well, nobody's perfect. That line killed me, because it was probably the best use of the Some Like It Hot ending that I've seen in an animated movie like this ever, or in any comedy to really like hit home like like what the, what happened at the end of sun like it hot so i gotta give them credit for pulling a couple of very good references out into this movie i don't know if it's as good as the breaking bad in zootopia because that was a great reference as well but this was a very solid reference um and then there are just some other really you know interesting things that they did with the characters now granted they also had there was a lot of stereotypes you know like the lady with the, the all the cats or you know, like the, you know, the Pomeranian being with these just rich yuppie type peoples or the dog walker being some, you know, hipster stoner kind of guy. It's just, I mean, there was a lot of very weird stereotypes in this movie, but also some things that, you know, might not be as common in animated films, but are, you're going to see more and more as these things become more progressive. Like one of the characters is this little, you know, gold, is this little bird, um, 
and when at the end when the bird it, you know gets back into the cage and the owner comes home the owner is this you know big burly like bald dude um you know he's just basically huge ripped all that but he's got tattoos all over his arms and he puts some bird seed on his head and the you know the bird comes over and pecks at it but what's interesting about that is that the guy has tattoos it's something that you're probably not you don't see as much in these movies because it's not something that is always put out there as normal but when you actually show it in the context like this of some you know big you know bodybuilder guy with tattoos who's got this cute little bird as his pet i mean it's like it, it there's nothing weird about it so it's it's cool that there are little social commentary things slipped in there that you probably wouldn't even notice unless you were really like digging in to look at it now the other problem is is that this movie i was hoping would have a little bit more social commentary you know kind of like another movie that rem that was reminiscent of this and that is over the hedge over the hedge is one of the best you know animated kids movie satires that i've seen ever it's a fantastic movie and this movie had the potential to kind of do that where it's playing off of stereotypes and kind of not necessarily not necessarily making fun of people but certainly like pointing out stereotypes and pointing out some of the ridiculousness out there um but it didn't really do that too much it mostly focused on just the animals and um you know their you know their little idiosyncrasies of their own um there was <laughs> a scene also where they go to a, a sausage factory where they're seeing hot dogs and sausages being made and I almost just, there's like this hallucination scene where all the hot dogs are, you know, anthropomorphic and dancing and singing and doing all this. It's one of those just random bizarre scenes that they throw into kids' movies. And I can't help but think about, now that there's a movie coming out called Sausage Party that's about the horrors of food being eaten, um, it just, <laughs> um, I couldn't help but think about that the entire scene. So, um, even though that movie hasn't been released yet, but it's just like, well... You know, if these things are sentient, this is horrible. This whole scene is terrifying. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, just a weird choice. But back to the animation. The animation in this movie is very bright, very colorful, much what you would get with the other Illumination movies that we've seen. Um, it's a little bit more real, like, I'm not going to say realistic, but a little more entrenched in reality than we've seen with some of the other ones at least like despicable me or the lorax which i mean obviously the lorax was meant to be really colorful but certainly a little bit more down to earth toned down you know that the animals are based on real animals um but they still have you know like the big you know the big eyes um especially when they do like the big puppy dog eye things um but one of the weirdest ones that bothered me the entire movie, this is not my key gripe, by the way, but there was one that really bothered me was um, the character of Katie, the, the girl who basically, um, you know, she's the, you know, Max and Duke's owner. Her character is, you know, this just like, you know, 20-something girl, you know, fashionable, kind of, tr you know, trendy kind of girl, you know, quirky, um, you know, she's got the short hair, the beret, all that stuff. I mean, she's adorable. Problem is, is that she, her entire character, reminded me of Jack Skellington from Nightmare Before Christmas, and then not in like this terrifying way, but just like her, the physical aspect of her character is like almost identical to Jack Skellington. She has these very long, thin legs, very small torso, and she's just like pencil thin character. Now I know that's you know it's animation, and there's always this like animation skews reality in a lot of ways of like having very thin, you know, wider characters. I mean, it, it, whatever animation does, it usually takes reality and makes it ridiculous in a sense. But this, it just, it bothered me for some reason because I was like, I shouldn't be looking at this character and thinking that's Jack Skellington before he died. But I was, it was really weird. Um, it was, it's, it's, it's very strange animation style. Um, but I guess if, you know, they made their money off of selling you know, Twinkies and Goggles, then, you know, what can't they do, right? Um, so, overall, I mean, the movie is fun. It has some very funny moments. It also has a lot of very dull moments and moments that I think were supposed to be funny that didn't quite land. Um, you know, a lot of stuff with Snowball, with Kevin Hart's character, were, it was a little weird. Blah. <laughs> But, I mean, it 
just overall, it felt like a mediocre movie. It was like a mediocre Pixar movie. And I don't want to necessarily compare this to Pixar, but I will say this, that Pixar at least tries to add more depth to its movies, whereas this one had no depth. The entire story was just about... I mean, ultimately, at the end, you kind of have this conflict of, like, well, Max and Duke are, you know, at, in you know butting heads, and they finally come to realize they really are like brothers. Um, that's probably the deepest this movie gets, but ultimately, that's not nearly as deep as you get with even a movie like Toy Story. A movie like Toy Story was, especially at its time, mind-blowingly unique. And even today, it's one of those, it's as a movie, not just as an animated movie, as a movie, it stands you know, stands out as this, you know, really incredible narrative and really deep story with something so mundane and simple. That's what the magic of what Pixar has been able to do with a number of their movies. This one definitely does not fall into that category. It's it's a fun movie. It's, you know, entertaining to a fault, but it's certainly not deep in any way, shape, or form. And it certainly doesn't, you know, take the risks that it could especially given the, the subject matter, the secret life of pets. Ultimately, so oh, so the secret life of pets is just the same old, you know, adventure story that we've seen a thousand other times. So, but entertaining, good enough. That's pretty much what I can say. Now, my key gripe. I actually have two key gripes. One of them is about the movie. The other one is about the studio. So I'm going to get to the one about the movie first. There's a, This is something that has happened over and over again. And I, re, I mentioned Over the Hedge, but even that wasn't the first movie to do it. But it's something that I'm seeing more and more in these movies. And it's annoying me. It's, it really annoyed me in Finding Dory. But in this one, again, it annoyed me. And especially the reason it really annoyed me in this one is because it was it just happened out of nowhere. So at the end of the movie, Duke gets picked up by the, uh, by animal control, you know, uh, Max goes to try to save him, Snowball and his goons show up, and ultimately they all get caught except for Max and Snowball, so they decide to join together and go get that animal control truck. So the next scene you see is Snowball and Max driving a bus. So first question, um, where did they get the bus? <laughs> how did the, how did this tiny bunny and a dog managed to steal a bus. This movie, up to this point, had at least some semblance of realism. And then suddenly, they steal a bus. And it was just like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I'm so, I'm tired of the trope of animals driving cars. But that wasn't even the worst of it, because after they crash the bus and save the day and do all this stuff, a pig drives up in a taxi. Like, just driving the taxi. <laughs> Like, there's a point where this movie goes from being, you know, kind of like, oh, this is this is a funny concept of what they do, what pets do when we're gone. And then it turns into just complete anarchy. <laughs> like, complete unrealistic anarchy. So, um, and that's just a trope that I'm seeing too often. We saw it in Finding Dory. I had the same problem there. Same thing here is it's just like... Uh, how how do you justify this? Where Where did they steal the bus? Where did that pig steal that taxi? Why is nobody not freaking out when they see a taxi driving down the street with dogs hanging out every single window and an alligator on the roof? Like, there's a point where this movie goes from being somewhat, like, cute, believable, to just asinine. And it kind of comes around at the end to a little bit of believability, but that, that whole just end chase scene, it, ugh, I'm so sick of that trope. I really am. Um, so then... The one other key gripe, and it's not about the movie itself, it's about the studio, and I have to I have to ding them on this, because we talk about movies that, you know, you go in, you've seen the trailer, and you've seen, you know, what, you know, the trailer shows you quite a bit. There's that fear that the trailer is going to show too much. This movie had, I think, two big trail had like two or three main trailers, you know, circling the last six months. It showed so much of this movie that you knew when these jokes were going to happen before they did. It was just, it you just, it, they happened. You knew they were coming. None of it was changed from the trailers. Everything that was in the trailers was in the movie. And, I mean, there was no surprise when it happened. So when there were jokes that were, they put in the trailers, when they happened in the movie, it's just kind of like a, huh, 
I remember seeing that already. I've already seen it 50 times. Specifically, I think of like the scene where Gidget and the cat are basically uh, on the roof and Gidget is slapping the cat saying, don't look at him, don't look at me. Or it's like, don't look at him, look at me. It's it's that scene, I've seen it a hundred times on the trailers and then seeing it here just in the movie, it was like, that, this, that, sh that moment should have had some real comedic impact, but since I've already seen it, I didn't, it, they completely, it fell flat. The studios need to know that if you're going to make an effective movie, don't show everything in the trailer. I know you want to get people to go see it, but they could have made a trailer much shorter with fewer of these very specific and good jokes and been highly successful. This movie has made over $300 million in the U.S. That's that's definitely a successful movie. But they could have done even better, probably, if they hadn't made these choices to just show you everything in the trailer. So, shame on you, Illumination. Shame on you. I think it was also Paramount, too. Whoever. But I blame all of you. You're wrong. You shouldn't do that. Um, so <laughs> another thing that just annoys me is they showed everything in the trailer. If it's a movie like Independence Day Resurgence, I'm okay with it because I don't really care what happens in that movie anyway. But this one, with jokes, it kind of hurts when they don't show up. So, um, I'd give this movie a 6 out of 10. It's fun, it's funny, but it's mediocre at best. Um, it, you know, especially because I knew all the jokes going in, that didn't help. But there were some very surprising moments, and it still was an entertaining movie from start to finish. Um, more cohesive than a movie like Angry Birds, definitely more coherent, but ultimately they they had too many opportunities that they missed, and it just, I think it fell flat in too many places. So, 6 out of 10, my review for uh, The Secret Life of Pets. So, that's my review. Let me know if you agree with me in the comments or disagree, or if you just want to discuss the movie in more detail. I know a lot of people probably have opinions about Viper and... Ricky, but um, let me know what you think. Um, subscribe, to my subscribe to my channel, um, check out my webpage, do all that fun stuff, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot for watching. Love you. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video. Be sure to keep up on all of my YouTube videos by clicking subscribe, and if you're already a subscriber, thank you, and you rock. Also visit my homepage at dkessner.com where you can find out about all my various other projects, including my written works. Hmm? How about that? You can also find me at my social media handles, so drop in and say hi. And again, thank you so much for all your support. Love you.